time to take our first foundational step into the world of international relations and explore how we make sense of IR as a discipline, as a collection of theories, and as a practice. In this video, I and colleagues from the IR program will attempt to define international relations as a discipline. We'll introduce you to the realm of international relations theory, both as a set of sense-making tools and as a family tree of ideas linked by history and conceptual lineage. We'll also share our thoughts on what makes a good international relations analyst. So what's the definition of international relations? <laughs> this is a trick question. There is no specific settled definition of international relations. And there's several reasons for this. If we go back to the mid 20th century, realist scholar Hans Morgenthau used the term international politics, which he argued included analysis of the political relations and problems of peace among nations. However, contemporary IR has come to encompass so much more than this. So while the focus on states and interstate relations that Morgenthau described is still very much part of the IR discipline, at the other extreme, IR includes almost everything that has to do with human relations at international and global scale. At this level, it's a systemic interrogation of international life in all its aspects. Let's back up for a moment from that definition because there's something we have to untangle. And that's the concept of power. The interrogation of power and the nature of power relationships in world affairs is central to international relations as a discipline. Power and interests are central to the study of politics at all levels, from international and domestic politics to the smallest of human groups and even interpersonal relations. And indeed, the study of politics and the study of international relations is really the study of relationship, about the interplay between people, power and interests. Power is something that people exercise. Interests are something that people have. And politics is about the relationship between the two. So one of our primary goals in the IR program is to help you develop a comprehensive literacy of power. So what is power? Well, it's most commonly thought of in terms of domination and control, of exercising power over others. But power can also be used in collaboration with others, exercised collectively. It can be about cooperation to, ch to achieve aims out of mutual self-interest just as much as it can be about pursuing self-interest through domination and control. Power can also be about the capacity to attract others as well as the capacity to compel. Another way to think of this is to distinguish between hard material power and soft ideational power. So if we bring it back to our attempt at definition, the field of international relations is primarily concerned with the power, interests and interactions of actors at the global or international level, with an emphasis on the political nature of those relationships and their implications for security, economies and societies. And this is where IR gets interesting. So international relations draws from and interacts with a number of other different disciplines. And that's from politics, strategic studies and diplomacy, to economics, history, law and sociology, as well as philosophy, geography, and all of the hard sciences, among others. It really is a multifaceted discipline. It's a broad church, if you will, which incorporates insights from these various intellectual streams, while always focusing on their political dimensions of the issues within its scope. So this diversity is what makes IR such an exciting and interesting field to study. Security is also a foundational concern of international relations. But what does security mean in the context of IR? What's being secured and from who? 
What are the risks associated with those threats? How are security threats addressed? And who benefits from security threats being addressed in the specific ways that they are? All of these are very important questions to ask when we look at any international security issue. So in Poll 1 SNS, we'll show you different ways in which international security is conceptualized and achieved, and the alternatives to conventional approaches to security that focus on states, that focus exclusively on national security. And we do this through the different lenses of IR theories. IR theories are the tools with which we think, criticize, argue, explain, and analyze international events. They're what we use to make sense of the complexity of the international system. Now, in IR, it's never enough to just look at the facts, because the facts can be interpreted in a range of different ways, depending on how they're understood, processed, and prioritized. So that's where the different IR theories come in. They provide us with a lens for understanding and processing and prioritizing what we see happening in the international system. So that this idea of the lens of the different sets of glasses to see different things about the international system, hence the glasses graphic here. But IR theories also give actors within the international system a guide for how to approach different situations and how to interpret the actions of other actors in the international system as well. So it has a very clear prescriptive dimension. So I like to use IL theory as a toolbox. So a toolbox of different ideas and different understandings that might help us explain certain issues in international relations and why actors, whether they be individuals, states, organizations do certain things. I think international theory doesn't provide us with any specific answers or clear definitions or explanation to these events, but it's a way that we can help understand why these events occur and what we can do as theorists and as students of international relations to help mitigate certain events happening from again in the future. Like all my IR scholars, um, I tend to take a fairly pragmatic and at times eclectic way in which I use uh, IR theory when looking at international security issues and to some degree it really reflects the nature of the security issue that you're trying to get your head around um, because different kinds of theory will provide you with different lenses and different tools um, with which to grapple with the phenomenon you're trying to make sense of. Um, so for example in my work I tend to focus a lot on Great power rivalry and sort of statecraft maneuvering uh, in Asia, with a focus in particular on uh, US China rivalry, where Russia fits in, and the uh, sort of dynamics of that, that emerging great power competition. And, and in that, uh, I tend to lean on uh, a lot of scholarship that works on ideas such as the balance of power, ideas of spheres of influence. Uh, and also the ways in which the self-identity about great power uh, and status and influence uh, affects how states adjusting things and telling what decisions they make about genetic alignments or, or military um, hardware acquisition programs or alliance vitalization or like. Um, but if, for example, you're looking at a different kind of security issue you'd like to do with so energy security, food security, or what might be described as non-traditional security, then there's different kinds of lenses that you probably uh, use to make sense of them. So for example, there might be institutional theory to look at ways in which states are trying to use institutions to bind their interests, to improve communication, and to collaborate in ways that uh, they might, other, might not otherwise do without the sort of promises and of, of, uh, shared benefits that come from the ways in which institutions are, are created um, and underpin their common endeavor. Uh, so the, the short answer to the what kinds of theories you use, it really depends on what the issue is that you're looking at and what questions you are trying to answer. International relations theories are not ideas that spontaneously manifest from nowhere. They have a history, they have a lineage. New theories have tended to emerge when previous theories came under critique on the back of real-world events or proved inadequate to explain specific problems. 
New theories have also emerged to include people and groups in IR discourses that were previously marginalised or invisible in pre-existing theories. Because there's an evolutionary aspect to the proliferation of different IR theories, we can try and map them out as a family tree based on a series of questions about their core assumptions. Please do pause the video here and have a look at this flowchart. So this is an attempt to do just that, that kind of family tree mapping. Here's another slightly different interpretation of the IR family tree. And again, I encourage you to pause the video and have a good look at this chart. But if we break it down to its simplest form, what we essentially see here is a visualization of the theories based on their interpretations of the nature of the international system, who the key actors are in the international system, and how those actors within the international system relate with each other. All international relations theories have a common set of features which we'll use as a basis for comparison across the semester. So first off, there's the unit of analysis. So the unit of analysis is specifically the who or what it is that's being analyzed in any specific theory. Often in international relations, it's the state that's the core unit of analysis. However, this isn't always the case. Lots of IR theories move beyond the state to have a different unit of analysis. You will need to grapple with different units of analysis depending on which theory that you're working with. And this is one of the key distinguishing features between different IR theories. Well, closely related to unit of analysis is the level of analysis. And so this is one of the tools we have for understanding how different actors relate to each other. International relations generally distinguishes between three levels of analysis. So you've got the international system, the state, and then the individual. The international system is the most common level that we study in international relations. Now, this is mostly studied either in terms of power relations, the different interests or polarities and alliances, or international organizations. While a systemic level is used mostly to revolve around interactions between states, systemic level analysis has opened up to the inclusion of non-state actors in global politics. If we move to the state level, this incorporates comparative, uh, comparative analyses of different states in terms of political system, decision-making processes and types of government, as well as how their different peoples, geographies, histories and cultures impact on their behavior in the international system. And this is important because all states are different and our analyses need to factor in those differences in order to be accurate and useful. The individual level perspective moves away from a state-centric state perspective on IR. So at the individual level, this could include an examination of individual leaders and influential people in foreign policy domains. It can also include the study of bureaucratic politics, looking at the role of bureaucrats in decision making. And it can also incorporate political psychology and insights about the political behaviours of the citizens of states. So all of these levels are useful in the international relations discourse, but we have to be very clear about which level we're looking at in any given time. Building on the concept of levels of analysis, we can then break down the different types of actors in the international system. So as IR analysts, we're interested in who these actors are and how they behave, and even more importantly, how they relate to each other. Now, as we've mentioned previously, traditional approaches to international relations interpret IR to mean relations between sovereign states. However, contemporary approaches to IR include other non-state actors, and these include multilateral institutions, multinational corporations, non-government organizations, social movements, and even individual people, among others. Even non-human life forms, 
ecosystems and future generations are now being included as actors in some perspectives. Our Pol 1 SNS journey will take us from the traditional view of state-centric international relations through to this contemporary reinterpretation of IR and the expansion of the IR theory family tree, which looks beyond the state and offers critical perspectives on global affairs. Every international relations theory has a set of core assumptions. Now, because of this, and because of the complexity of the international system, different international relations theories might be more appropriate than others in relation to any specific problem or issue that we're trying to understand. IR theorists ask many different types of questions, and these different questions are best answered by employing the methods and theories that are most appropriate to them. So one of our core aims in Pol 1 SNS is for you to develop a basic understanding of the family tree of IR theories and the core assumptions of each, so that you know when and which theory to use, depending on what problem, problem you're looking at, and so that you've got a conceptual toolkit that'll give you the tools you need to interrogate any issue in international relations. And as with the informative graphics I've included in all of the videos across this video series, this is a good place to pause the video and take a closer look at the table on the slide, because this gives you an insight into some of the different core assumptions across different IR theories. And we'll obviously tease this out further across the lecture series in Pol 1 SNS. As you start to get your head around the different IR theories, you'll notice patterns in how they differ from each other. So one of these recognisable patterns revolves around ontology. And ontology is about questions of the nature of reality and how we relate to everything around us. Or in the international system, how different actors in the international system relate to each other and how they relate to the system itself. Another important pattern relates to the epistemology of each IR theory. So epistemology revolves around questions such as what constitutes knowledge and how do we measure the validity of how we know what we know. These issues are important because all IR theorizing is always developed by someone, for someone and for some purpose. So untangling the worldview of each IR theory is integral to teasing those questions out. And the act of theorizing itself is a political enterprise. So we need to understand who is generating IR theory and to what ends. In my view, an international relations analyst uh, is someone who's got a, a wide range of set of skills and interests, that's to say, because where international relations happens as a scholarly discipline and as a practice, uh, sits at the intersection of a wide range of fields. You, know, you need to be one part political scientist, one part economist, one part sociologist, one part historian, uh, to get a sense of, and it's just part of it, uh, to get a sense of the richness of the tapestry of, of what is being studied. I think perhaps the, the greatest um, attribute that any student of international relations has is a kind of curiosity about the ways that states and peoples, diverse cultures, try to advance their interests, try to manage their competition and reduce the risks of that competition spiraling out of control and promote shared interests. And the challenges that they face in doing this uh, in a world in which we have wildly uneven uh, wealth, power uh, and prosperity, and of course wildly uneven influence of particular cultures and values. So some cultures and values have significant advantages and others have significant disadvantages. Um, and so if that's you know, to, to be um, uh, adapted in international relations, those sort of puzzles need to animate you need to kind of get out of bed on a cold wet night in a cold morning rather in uh, August, but also present you with a whole range of things in which you can dig to try to find the answers to the, to the questions that they're looking at. As I said at the top, what makes international relations particularly interesting and what IR students have included 
um, find rewarding is the ability to cut across a wider range of disciplines. So there will be history here, some time in philosophy, time to do 45 years, looking at how all the trade investment patterns flow, and the density of energy and climate, and bring it together to have a you know, big picture analysis of, of the fundamental challenges that humanity is facing today. There is no magic theory of everything that flawlessly explains every interconnected element of IR. Each international relations theory explains some aspects of global affairs and leaves out other things. And that's because any theory is only a representation of reality. It's not reality itself. And as representations, they're up for critique. They're up for reinterpretation and even rejection. It's our job as IR practitioners to draw from the full theoretical toolkit to help us best understand the patterns and details of what we're seeing in world affairs. And this is an approach that Peter Katzenstein and Nabur Okawara have called analytical eclecticism. Keep this eclectic approach in mind as we explore the diverse topics and the different IR theories across the Pole One SNS curriculum. What makes a good IR analyst? So I think a good IR analyst is someone who listens, whether that's listening to people who are experiencing insecurity or conflict, listening to policymakers and governments and seeing if what they're actually saying is matching the policy output, or listening to your colleagues, academics, as well as teachers here at the university. I think that listening is an incredibly underrated skill within security studies and international relations, because how else can you understand the different ways in which people experience insecurity if you're not listening to their stories and the different aspects of security, whether that's your human security, as we look at within the critical security sections, or it's your more traditional hard security that we see with liberalism and realist theories. Without listening, it's hard to understand exactly how security actually impacts people. We've seen it more recently with our foreign minister, Penny Wong, travelled to the Pacific, where she's really emphasised that Australian foreign policy is now listening to its neighbours, to its partners and to states, and that the importance of listening is what makes good policy and as well as good foreign policy analysis. In Poll 1 SNS, we encourage you to develop a critical approach to the subject material. So that means don't take anything on face value and interrogate each of the IR perspectives that are presented in this subject with a high level of critical scrutiny. Part of learning to apply rigorous critical scrutiny means that we need to be conscious of the evidence that we draw from to develop our arguments and positions. Now, in the angry post-truth world that we live in right now, there's frankly a lot of bullshit flying around that masquerades as truth, and it can be difficult to untangle reliable information from myths and disinformation. Now, it's funny, most people think that they have well-honed bullshit detectors, but the reality is that almost no one does. And that's because good information hygiene takes training, it takes critical self-reflection and constant effort. But fortunately, there are well-established methods for sourcing reliable information and establishing solid evidence as the basis for your arguments. And there are well-established methods for applying critical self-reflection to the arguments that you present and to the inherent biases that you might have that influence how you interpret the world around you. And indeed, those processes are at the core of what seeking knowledge in academia is all about. That's what we're about here at university. But let's come back to sourcing information. So easy first step, be mindful about the quality of the source material that you get information from. And remember that not all sources of information are created equal. If we're looking for the most reliable information sources, it's in the peer-reviewed academic, academic literature. There are a wide range of perspectives in the academic literature. However, all academic studies have to demonstrate systematic research design and go through a rigorous quality control process to reach publication. And that's done in order to increase the reliability of their findings. So you can see that 
peer review process sort of roughly illustrated on slide here. Now this same process is clearly not true of other media sources, including popular news media, and especially your favorite YouTubers or podcasters. Always ask who the authors are, always inquire as to their expertise, and always dive into what their potential biases might be that might have an influence on their perspectives. In addition to quality, also try and draw from a range of different information sources. Develop your own positions by critically evaluating a range of different perspectives rather than just relying on one or two. And finally, while it's great to subject the perspectives that you reject to critical scrutiny, make sure that you also give equal critical evaluation to the perspectives that you agree with. So if you can apply all of these skills of critical evaluation in your study of international relations, you'll be on solid ground. So remember what we talked about with levels of analysis. There's an individual level. And individuals like you and I are, of course, important. After all, international relations is essentially a system of interaction between human beings. And as an individual, you're not just a passive subject of international relations as directed by political elites and official state actors. You have the means of being an actor in your own right. As individuals, we're complex human beings. We're each coming from different histories and life experiences with different personalities, identities, needs and preferences. Like all actors in international relations, we have different interests that shape how we interact with and experience political processes. We all have biases. We all inevitably interpret IR from the perspective of our own background and our own baggage. So in poll on SNS, we encourage you to become conscious of the biases that you bring to your analysis of IR and to develop an empathic approach to evaluating different perspectives on their own terms. Now, this is a lot harder than it might initially appear, but it's critical to good analysis of IR and sound professional competency in this field. So in summary, these are the key thoughts that you can take away from this video. IR is about power, interests and relationships between actors in the international system. As a study of power, it's also an interdisciplinary field with many different niches. And we can make sense of this diversity by using the many different IR theories as a toolkit. Each theory has its own level and unit of analysis, worldview and core assumptions. Develop your skills as an international relations analyst. Learn how to understand and use each of the different IR theories. Learn how to present an argument backed by sound evidence rather than just throwing out an opinion. Cultivate a critical approach to the subject material and to the information that you consume. Interact with a diverse range of people, especially those who are different from you. Understand yourself as an actor in international relations, along with the inevitable biases and baggage that you bring to it. And of course, read as much and as widely as you can 